assurance from God that uh, together we can look to the word of the Lord and your hearts will be open to the voice of a, of a friend and, and trust that uh, I come tonight with, with a word from the Lord and no ill will, but just something that if, if you're troubled by what I say tonight, let me preach to me and you can just listen in, okay? 2 Samuel chapter 18 and verse number 1. The Bible says, And David numbered the people that were with him and set captains of thousands and captains of hundreds over them. And David sent forth a third part of the people under the hand of Joab and a third part under the hand of Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, Joab's brother, and a third part under the hand of Ittai, the Gittite. I practiced in my room today to read that verse. And the king said unto the people, I will surely go forth with you myself also. But the people answered, Thou shalt not go forth. For if we flee away, they will not care for us. Neither if half of us die will they care for us. But now thou, he says, art worth ten thousand of us. Therefore now it is better that thou succour us out of the city. And the king said unto them, What seemeth you best I will do? And the king stood by the gate side and all the people came out by hundreds and by thousands. And the king commanded Joab and Abishai and Ittai, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man, even with Absalom. And all the people heard when the king gave all the captains charge concerning Abraham. So the people went out into the field against Israel. And the battle, look, was in the wood of Ephraim, where the people of Israel were slain before the servants of David. And there was there a great slaughter that day of 20,000 men. For the battle was there scattered over the face of all the country. Please, he knows what he's doing. Look at this line. And the wood devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. Out of 20,000 casualties, if you listed the cause of death, more than half would have said they did not die by spear, they did not die by sword, they did not die by any weapon formed against them. They died because of their location. They were slaughtered by their surroundings. They died due to their environment. I've got a sound to, to sound here tonight, and I pray that every man in this house will let me speak into your life. Every young person will hear the impassioned, shattered voice of this preacher. Stay out of the woods. Stay out of the woods. Jesus, we need you tonight. I need you to touch my voice and help me tonight to preach. I pray our hearts would be open to receive what you're going to say. If you don't do it, we're going to fail here tonight, Lord, because there's nothing in me on which to trust. But I pray tonight you would have our hearts ready to receive what you would say to us. Speak to us by your word. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray it. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. I'm going to need your help tonight because if you're going to demand that my voice climb to the highest rafters before you get excited, you're going to sit there and get blisters on your backside because I just don't have enough voice to move you with volume this evening. I need your heart to be open to the word of the Lord because I have a mission from heaven's throne this evening. That's all I know to tell you. I will not beat around the bush, but instead... I'm going to come right to the point this evening. I take it upon myself at the direction of the Holy Ghost, a task which is not necessarily enviable, but one which is needful. I kind of believe the purpose of the pulpit ought to be to take people to heaven. I kind of think preaching ought to help us be closer to God. I do believe the word of the Lord says he chose by the foolishness of preaching not to save sinners. Now it does, but that's not what it said said he chose by the foolishness of preaching to save those that believe. You and I are saved by preaching. Oh my goodness. I need preaching. I never get to a place that I don't need somebody to preach into my life. 
I may have to whisper tomorrow, but I'm going to preach this evening. I'm never going to get to a place so high in my ministry that I don't need somebody to preach into my life. I'll never live for God so long that I don't need a preacher. Some of you have had the Holy Ghost longer than I've lived. You still need preaching. Some of you are brand new to the church. Fall in love with preaching. If I go to heaven one day, it's going to be because of preaching. The pulpit is to call us to Christ. And in so doing, it is needful sometimes to sound a warning, to alert the people of God against dangers that would pull us away. As the prophet said, to blow the trumpet in Zion and to sound an alarm in his holy mountain. On occasion, the pulpit has to fly in the face of a generation addicted to entertainment. Even a church generation addicted to entertainment in preaching. This is where it's going to get real tight until I have time to get further into this. But this evening, God sends me to remind this precious group of people in this outstanding district that has wonderful leadership. God sends me into this pulpit tonight to remind you and to remind me that there is a danger in worldliness. I am not a clothesline preacher and I will not be one tonight. But worldliness, being like this present world, is not God's will for my life. It is not God's will for your life. It is not God's will for my family. It is not God's will for your family. It is not God's will for the church I attend. It is not God's will for the church you attend. It is not God's will for this generation. I don't care how many decades have passed. Worldliness is not what God would have for us. Now you're nervous right now and I'm going to help you get over that. This is not a cult. We're not like some Branch Davidian group that isolates ourselves inside a walled compound. We are in this world. But let's remember at the same time, we are not of this world. And, okay, here, here's where I'm going. And it becomes, oh, so easy for the systems of this world and the thinking of this world and the priorities of this world and the affections of this world and the values of this world to attach themselves, even, yes, to Holy Ghost-filled Jesus-named people. But I remind us tonight of the words of the Scriptures. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love this world, the love of the Father is not in him. I wish I had enough voice to preach this. I want every young person to hear me shun worldliness. I want every young man to hear this voice of this pastor tonight. Stay away from worldliness. I charge every Holy Ghost filled man. Lead your family away from worldliness. I call on every righteous lady maintain a godly separation from the world. This church, his church ought not talk like, look like, think like, dress like, be like. Listen to me. I want to be balanced. I plan to be reasonable, but I will be biblical. And the book still says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. I will not spend the poor limited resources of my vocal cords convincing you I've got a right to preach this. You didn't pay to get in. We live in a world that has got 29 dozen different voices trying to call people out of the church. 
everything from Hollywood to Madison Avenue screams at families and tries to get them to be like this world. Everything around us calls us to be like this world. Everything echoing in our ears says be like this world. I think it's okay for the pulpit to stand up and fly in the face of culture and say wait just a minute. We're not like what's around us. We're not I don't love the things they love. I don't hate the things they hate. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. He baptized not just my soul. He baptized my affections. He baptized my priorities. He baptized my values. He baptized my likes and my dislikes. Hey, stay out of the woods. Well... There's going to be some of you go away tonight saying, I used to like him. It's okay, I used to like you too. And I still do. The story of David's battle in our text tonight, the events that lead up to it are indeed sad ones. David, the man after God's own heart, has led the nation successfully for quite some time. The people of God have prospered. The nation is at its apex militarily, economically, and religiously. Jerusalem has been recaptured. The Ark of the Covenant resides there as God ordained. And yet David's life and reign were marred and forever tainted by the sordid affair with Bathsheba. In a season when David should have been leading the people in battle, instead he is lounging at home. And from his rooftop he spies his neighbor bathing and lusts after her. When the sinful choice that he makes leads to the conception of a child, David attempts to cover his tracks by calling her husband Uriah home from the battle. Uriah's integrity prevents this scheme from working, and so David arranges for his death in the battle. And a prophet of God confronts him, names his sin, and the judgment is that the sword of the Lord will not depart from his house and so is set into motion a chain of tragic events which heap heartache upon tragedy in David's family. The baby dies his son Amnon assaults his half sister Tamar Absalom her full brother is so furious that he arranges for the death of Amnon and then Absalom fearing the vigilante justice of his father flees from the nation and is gone for years from David's presence. And then Absalom, upon returning, begins to steal the hearts of the people. Absalom stationed himself by the gates, and as folks would come in, he would say, what is your problem? They would relate to him what judgment they were seeking from the king. And Absalom would undermine David's authority by saying, oh, if I were just king, I would do thus and so on. I would give you this, and I would do that for you, until finally when all of the hearts of the people are turning away from the king and being turned toward Absalom. Then Ahithophel counsels Absalom to make his strike. Now is the time. Lead the revolt and a, and a coup uh, is raised up there in the land and civil war is undergone between David and his own son. David flees with those who are loyal to him and the civil war is set. There are those that say only about 4,000 people went out with David. The Bible does not tell us. It simply says that he divides them into thirds for the conflict. And he puts one third under each of the three different men that I read to you tonight. As David's men are leaving for the battle, he asks them to show mercy on his son. In spite of what Absalom has done, he pleads that when they find him, they will show mercy on him. It was a furious conflict conflict that ensued that day with over 20,000 men falling in battle. But what is interesting to me is that more than half of those did not die from an arrow. They did not die from a sword. They did not die from a spear or any other weapon of war. More than 10,000 of those men died that day because of their surroundings. The Bible records that the battle raged over a wooded area and that the terrain killed more people than the sword did. Can you imagine that? Over 10,000 casualties who fell simply because of their location. More than 10,000 men who died. Not
not from the battle, but from their environment. More than 10,000 corpses littered the countryside, not because their enemy was too strong, not because they didn't have the right weapons, not because they didn't have the right armor, not because they weren't skilled enough, but because they put themselves in a place that soldiers did not belong. They didn't belong in the woods. They belonged on the battlefield and they were destroyed that day because of one trip into the woods. I don't expect you to enjoy this like last night, and I don't either, but I've been in this just long enough that I've seen far too many people who have sat on camp meeting pews and then fell victim, not because their enemy was too strong for them. Folks, our enemy ain't nothing, got nothing on us. He can't even scare me off an airplane. I'm not scared of the enemy. Nobody is destroyed because the enemy is too big. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I've watched them fall, not because they didn't have the right weapons, because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. I've seen them fall, not because their armor wasn't any good, because I want you to know that breastplate of righteousness, that girdle of truth, that helmet of salvation, that's good stuff. But I've lived in this long enough to see people that fell because they put themselves in the wrong surroundings. I've seen spiritual corpses litter the countryside because godly people got way too comfortable in the wrong surroundings. They got too satisfied with the wrong friendships and they got too comfortable in the wrong conversation. You don't want no preaching here tonight. They got too comfortable with off-color humor. And they got too comfortable with unclean websites. And they got too comfortable with office flirtation. The enemy wasn't big enough to get them, but the woods. I've seen great men and wonderful women and fantastic young people who thought a little trip into the world wouldn't really hurt them that bad, only to discover that the woods were not as safe as they thought they were. Can you hear the heart of this pastor? Can you hear the voice of your pastor? Stay out of the woods. Stay out of the woods. Stay out of the world. Stay out of temptation. Stay out of compromise. Stay out of the woods. It's not safer to run away. It's not more pleasant to flee to the woods. It's not the place for you. You don't belong in some place. The Holy Ghost in you ought to get uncomfortable in some settings. Well, I've spent a great portion of my ministry up till just the last few years preaching to young people. Okay, a lot of what I did. I'm having a midlife crisis. This is the first summer since 1996. I'm not preaching at a youth camp. Oh. It pains me greatly. You had to take a picture of that moment, didn't you? Yeah, thanks, Slick. It is just amazing to me. You start preaching at young people about keeping themselves clean from the world, keeping themselves pure from the world, keeping themselves unspotted from the world, and parents will stand up and do cartwheels over the pews like I'm some kind of hired dog. Sick them, get them, sick them, get them. Like all of a sudden when you turn 21, temptation vanished.
act like you're too spiritual, too holy at 45 years old to have your peer look you in the eye and say, don't fall, don't mess up, don't sin, don't make a mistake, don't gamble. Are you hearing this preacher tonight? Stay out of the woods. Stay out of the woods. Stay out of the woods. The devil still wants to destroy you. The devil wants to destroy your family. Sir, plant your feet in the door of your house and say certain things are not coming in here. Certain things will not invade my family. We won't go some places. We won't do some things. We're going to stay out. the woods I'm going to try to help you tonight the woods are dangerous because they look enticing let's be honest a wooded area is a beautiful thing did you see some of the pictures they showed up here in those towns they didn't show the local garbage dump they didn't say who would like to go to whatever, and then show you a picture of the, of the resident landfill. There's nothing enticing about that. But I noticed how many of them showed the woods because there's something attractive about the woods. I grew up in a little town out in the country in southeastern Illinois, and behind our house there were several acres of woods. Honey, when you get up in the springtime and that honeysuckle would be in bloom... Didn't anything look scary about it? Didn't anything look frightening about it? Nothing repulsive. Nothing nothing to drive you away. But out there in the sunshine mowing the front yard, those woods said, come up here. This is cool. This is pleasant. This is inviting. My family and I were in San Francisco a couple of years ago. Thank you for your prayers. And we went north out of San Francisco up through South Salido up in the Muir Woods where they've got the Redwoods. Sun. It's spectacular. Those trees, 250, 300 feet tall, and all the ground covered with this beautiful carpet of green moss. There's nothing in there that looks frightening. There's nothing in there that looks repulsive. It's beautiful. Pastor, how can something so pretty be dangerous? How can something I enjoy so much be a weight to me? How can it be wrong if it feels so right, said the song. How can something that I enjoy possibly be a danger to me? Look at it, Pastor. It's beautiful. It's just woods. It's attractive. I got a news flash for you. It wouldn't be temptation if it wasn't alluring. It's not a question of how beautiful it is. It's how much danger is there. A few years ago, I preached the South Dakota camp meeting. Now, South Dakota rents a campground in the Black Hills. It is spectacular. Oh, friends, God took extra time on that place. I mean, it's just gorgeous. I get up early in the morning, get out there, and there'd be deer walking outside my cabin. Turkeys coming up through the woods. I got out over across the road. You've been there, haven't you? Over across the road, there's, these, there's this huge valley. And there's these rocks that just jut out into space. I'd take my Bible. I'd go out there early in the morning. I'd dangle my feet over that thing looking down into that valley. There'd be elk grazing down in the ocean. And I did that every morning I was there. Well, I got there Monday. I did it Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning. On Wednesday in the day service, Brother Leg, Gary Leg, the superintendent, got up and said, Oh, by the way, parents, please remind your children to stay away from the rocks where the rattlesnakes sun themselves. I went up to Brother Leg. I said, I'm not trying to help you run your district, but that'd be a real good Monday announcement. I'm just thinking, wait until the last day may not be the best plan of action on that matter. Maybe you want to post a sign in the guest evangelist room to that effect. But I'll grant you one thing. When I got up on Thursday morning, that place didn't look near as pretty as it did the day before. 
because somebody had shown me that even though it looked pretty, it was dangerous. I'm trying to be your friend, but I didn't get an attitude and suck my thumb saying, why can't I go out there? Why can't I sit on the rocks? Other people go on the rocks. Why can't I go? No, I was saying, thank God for a preacher that told me it was dangerous. Thank God for a preacher that spared me heartache. Thank God for a... Oh, I wish some of you'd rise up and say, Pastor, I want to thank you. Pastor, I say thank you. I know I don't go where they go, but you've kept me safe. More have died from the woods than have ever died from the enemy. The devil can't take your soul. He can't make you backslide. He can't destroy you but the woods. As lovely as they look. As enticing as they might appear. As beautiful as they may seem. Many have entered who never came out again. Look at me. I'm 42 years old. Clean living has preserved my youthful appearance. But I've lived long enough that I've seen them disappear by the scores into the woods saying things like it's too hard to live for God. I just want to take a little stroll through my carnality. I just want to escape for a little while into the woods of my own pleasure and my own way. I've got a right. I've been disappointed. I've been hurt. And we watched them vanish. And we've prayed. And we've trusted. And we've interceded. And we've watched. But many, in fact most, never came back again somewhere in that journey they met dangers they never knew existed somewhere in that little trip they encountered obstacles they weren't looking for somewhere into that voyage into the woods the woods got a grip on them and would not let them come back beware of the beauty beware of the lure love not the world stay out of the woods stay out of the woods stay out of the woods I will tell you why the woods are so dangerous because woods disorient the victims we've all heard the accounts a hunter a hiker an experienced man gets out into the woods He can't find his way back. We've heard the heart-rending stories of a child who wanders away from a family campsite and doesn't have to go far before he can't find his way back. Whether they wander or enter on purpose or just somehow lose their way, listen to me right now. I want every young person to listen to me right now. And I want everybody that ain't young to listen to. Here is the truth. Getting out of the woods is immeasurably harder than getting in. Anybody can play around with temptation. Anybody can flirt with the world. Anybody can make a trip in. But not everybody makes the trip back out. It seems... Like a man could just turn back around and go back the way he came. It seems like if he went this way to get in the woods, he could just turn around and go back that way. But there's so many things to fall over and so many things to walk around and so many obstacles in his way and so many things that fight his return journey until pretty soon he finds himself walking in circles and he doesn't even know which way to go. I wish you could hear me right now. I'm thinking of a young man out of the church that I pastor. He grew up in that place. He's been in every Sunday school class. He knows what to do. But right now he can't find his way back to the altar. He can't find his way back to the church because he's so deep out.
out in the woods. He'd have his mind all confused. I need you to pray with me right now. We're fighting so hard. I'm not suggesting. Come on, pray with me. I'm not suggesting that everybody here is backslid. I'm not suggesting you're all a bunch of carnal heathens. But if I can rescue one, the Holy Ghost would have me ignore everybody here to find one young man, to find uh, to find one lady that's flirting over the internet with some guy from another town, to find one man that's playing around with pornography online. He would send me after you and say stay out of the woods stay out of the woods you're going to get so deep in that thing you can't find your way back help can be just over the hill and that man winds up wandering in circles until he dies that's the danger with woods that's the danger with the world it's easier to go in there than it is to get out. Once a man or a woman or a boy or a girl is trapped there, they stumble over sins and they get tripped up by desires and they fall over hurts both real and imagined and try as they might, they just can't get their life straightened out. I told you the truth was that getting out of the woods is harder than getting in. Let me tell you another truth. Staying out of the woods is easier than getting out of the woods.
It is so tight in here right now. Because some of you are looking at me saying, hey, do you think he and I, I thought I was preaching. But I never messed up. I never get caught. I never get trapped. I never do that. Oh, really? Are you more spiritual than David? Are you smarter than Solomon? Are you stronger than Samson? Are you better than all those guys? I got a feeling every one of us is still carrying flesh. I got a feeling every one of us is still subject to temptation. I've got a feeling every one of us needs this message that says, don't you think you can handle it? Don't you think you can play with it? Don't you think you can gamble? self-righteous. Keep yourself clean. Keep yourself pure. Gentlemen, keep your family out of the woods. You say, oh, but Brother Graham, I've seen some come back. I have too. Scarred, wounded, bruised, Scratched and battered. When you read one of those stories about a hiker being lost, and then you hear the great news that they've rescued him, I've never heard the news report say, and while he was there, he packed on five pounds of muscle. He looks great. He's clean and well-groomed. His body mass index has plummeted four points. He's in better shape now than when he went in. You ever heard that? You ever heard one person that got lost in the woods and came back out in better shape than they went in? No, when they come out, we got to put them in the hospital and nurse them back to health. And if you ask them, was it a good experience, they would say, I'd never want to do it again. I've never found one backslider that prayed back through and was in better shape than they were when they went. They damaged their marriage. They hurt their family. They destroyed their kids. They wiped out their income because the woods will take you places you never thought you'd go. that suggest that these woods were home to wild beasts and what the quicksand did not consume the beasts did I want to tell you something you are more than a match for the devil as long as you're in the church but but you ain't near big enough to handle him when you're out of the church. I'm going to be your friend right now. I'm going to be your friend. But you hook your fingers in your overalls and say, well, I'm a pretty good fella. Even if God wasn't in my life, I'd, I'd be living in the suburbs with 2.3 kids and 1.2 dogs and I'd be paying my taxes and eating my vegetables and flossing regularly. I'd be a good guy. I wouldn't do nothing wrong with me. I wouldn't be like those deadbeats I'd see out there. I wouldn't be messed up like that. There, but for the grace of God, you could be the biggest cocaine addict in the state of Wisconsin if it wasn't for the grace of God. know if I believe that. I don't care if you believe that. If you get out of this church, there are beasts you can't handle. Honey, you can deal and conquer lust with the Holy Ghost, but get outside the church and you can be the biggest deviant in your city. I just wish you'd hear me right now. You can't play with this stuff. You can't gamble with this stuff. Your soul is on the line. You're not tougher than multitudes before you. You're not stronger than those who have preceded you. They went in and the beast devoured them. But if you stay here, there's nothing that can touch you. Stay. 
Get all of your 
nobody knows about. We get a grip on you you never anticipated. Until you can't get loose. And the enemy will destroy your family at his leisure. But I am in the Holy Ghost right now. I'm tired of seeing the enemy bust up apostolic marriages through this junk on the internet. together. 